this computer. All right. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Without further ado, sorry about all those technical errors. We'll uh, begin. Uh, so this is the first of five classes, inshallah, that I will be, um, you know, have the honor of being a guest of the Maurid Hind Institute to teach. And uh, it's part of their tarbiyah sessions or tarbiyat sessions, as we would say in Persian and Urdu. And for these five classes, we will be covering the Pan Nomea Saadi, which is one of the texts, the lesser known texts, generally speaking, uh, attributed to uh, Sheikh Saadi. But uh, hopefully, we'll be getting into this and, and seeing all the wisdom and benefits that the text has to offer. So, first, a little bit about the group that I am uh, working with. They're based in India. And um, uh, to be frank, I don't know much, about, I didn't know much about the group before uh, we talked to each other, but it seems like. Uh, that their aim is one with mine, and that is to kind of expand our understanding of the Islamic tradition and kind of dive deep into these, these texts and this rich history that we have. So uh, I'm very much uh, happy to be working with them. Uh, I won't read all the text on every slide, so inshallah, if you're interested, you can kind of pause and uh, read, but I also, in the interest of time, want to uh, make sure we have enough to get through all the uh, material that we have. And these are all their chapters that you can find around the world. Maybe you can find one closest to you and uh, be in contact with them for classes like this, inshallah. All right, so in this first class, we're not actually going to be reading from the text we'll be covering, but we're gonna be talking about Sa'di more generally. But before we do that, I'd like to kind of get into who I am. So I'm not a stranger to you as I'm bothering you guys for this five uh, class session. So my name is Muhammad Ali. That's my real name, but I go by Shahzadeh online. Maybe you've seen some of my efforts kind of in this sphere. And Shahzadeh is kind of an Iranian inside joke. It's the opposite of Qarbzadeh, right? So we have Qarb, which is west, and Shah, which is east. And Qarbzadeh in Persian kind of means someone who's like too westernized, right? And I kind of came up with this joke against myself. And I call myself Shahzadeh. I'm too easternized. I'm too interested <laughs> in uh, Eastern culture. Um, I run Persian Poetics, which is an online project where we translate Persian poetry. We are on the social media handles like Twitter and Instagram. We also have a website. And I am a founder of Rumi Was Muslim, which is another kind of similar project. We are also on those same handles and we have a website as well. And uh, here is me on the right a couple of years ago, actually visiting, you know, appropriate for this class, visiting uh, Saadi's grave. And we'll be looking at more pictures of that. Uh, later hopefully you can all have the, the chance to visit it in Shiraz. So this is Persian Poetics. This is kind of the uh, medium that I use it the most. Uh, this is our Instagram page so hopefully later you can take a chance to check it out. Basically we translate uh, the poems by people like Saadi. So you can see right here the, the main one we have right now is Saadi, Rumi, Hafez, basically all the names you know Iqbal etc. All the names that you uh, guys are probably interested in and we try to translate it in kind of clear concise and poetic English. So if you've looked at the translations of a lot of these uh, texts, unfortunately, they're very archaic, they're kind of hard to uh, you know, connect with. So we kind of hope that the translations that we're providing are more interesting to you all and you can kind of uh, connect with them, so to speak. So this is one of our projects. And uh, this is the website that I mentioned, although I would suggest you find our material on Instagram, you know, it's the most up to date. And this is on our Twitter page. We had this uh, thread that kind of started the quote unquote Rumi was Muslim project. Oh, we have a chat. Oh, you're too kind. You're very kind. Um, uh, basically, this thread I posted it about, I want to say almost two years now, and it was kind of highlighting the what we talk about on uh, this website, which is rumiwasmuslim.com, and this page, which uh, there's also a Twitter counterpart. Um, and it's the issue of translations, kind of, I want to say botched translations, but they weren't accidentally made that way. They were purposely kind of mistranslating Rumi and kind of, you know, uh, looking at it from an Orientalist gaze and removing the Islam and things like that. So this project was kind of our little pushback against this uh, this internet phenomenon. I'm sure all of you have seen Rumi quotes on the internet. And if you haven't seen this project before, I'm sorry to inform you that most of them are fake or they're edited or poorly translated. So, you know, inshallah, uh, in this project, we're kind of aiming to fix those uh, quotes and, and try to make a more authentic version of Rumi available on the internet. So, uh, all right, enough about the things that I do, though. Uh, more about the course. So this course is broken up into five lessons. And the first one, which is the one we're on right now, we will be just talking about kind of what we're looking at and also mostly Saadi as a person. So again, we won't be looking at the text much today, but just kind of Saadi's personality and uh, why he's so important and why we're reading him, you know, 800 years later. 
And then the next uh, few classes, the next four, will be dedicated to various sections of the actual text. So we're going to be reading in Persian together, hopefully, as I said, and uh, kind of diving into the lessons and hopefully extracting some of the wisdom. So, all right, so the main objectives of this course are to, of course, as we are going to be in this class or in this section of it, becoming more familiar with Sa'adi Shirazi. So I'm sure we've all heard of him and we're all aware that he's an important person in our tradition, but kind of learning more about him, his life trajectory, the type of things he lived through, maybe drawing some lessons from that as well. And then uh, in the next four classes, of course, reading the Pan-Nome itself, which kind of means like book of wisdom, if I wanted to translate it. And uh, also generally the style that it's written in the Vaz, which is kind of, I don't know if advice is a good uh, translation for it, but basically this type of poetry where uh, it's not like love poetry, it's more advice to you, you know, teaching you how to live a better life, etc. And we're going to increase our personal Arabic vocabulary. So I said we'd be reading directly from the Persian. So inshallah, you guys will be increasing kind of your vocabulary. And depending on what language you speak, it might be helpful to you. So a lot of times when uh, people were speakers of Turkish or Urdu or anything like that, they read Persian Arabic vocabulary. They find that it helps their kind of mother tongue because those words are present as well, but they're kind of considered like, you know, um, higher level words in their uh, mother uh, language, but they didn't realize that they were actually connected in this larger tradition. And uh, hopefully also kind of learn Islamic ethics and uh, what it means to kind of have, uh, you know, uh, a Muslim outlook on morality and the world and things like that. All right. So what is a pan nome? I kind of already translated it. It means a letter of advice. You see the nome uh, come in the end of a lot of titles. Uh, this just means letter or it can mean book, things like that. And um, panned just means advice. Um, it wasn't compiled by the author, this genre generally. So I should explain that um, there's kind of two types of works that we have in the Muslim tradition. There's uh, a work that was produced by the person, an original production that they put together. Like for example, Saadi's Bustan and Golestan. This would be considered like an original work. And then the other type of work is a compilation. So someone later looks at the works that this person has left behind and they kind of select kind of choice sections of it and they say okay here this is a new work right so in persian we call this gozide sometimes which means selection and the pan nome is an uh, example of this the whole genre is basically they would take uh again the, the writings of existing uh authors and they would piece together important parts that they wanted to present kind of to create a school curriculum almost kind of like i do in my classes and they would teach them in madrasas usually so this is part of like the madrasa education right so when a kid would be growing up and learning how to read and write they would also kind of be learning these wisdoms for life and uh attar also has one so if you look at pan nome about half of them are related to attars pan nome and the other half are related to saadi but of course in this class we'll be looking at saadis all right so now on to saadi shirazi himself so just a short biography of saadi and on the right uh, we have a popular depiction of him you might probably have seen this uh, I don't know how accurate it is or where it's from, but this is Saadi in our imagination, so I chose this. Saadi was born Musharraf ad din ibn Musleddin al-Shirazi in about 1210. Uh, the dates, of course, then are all circle. We don't know exactly when they were born. And his name is also uh, a matter of dispute as well. Some people argue about which uh, comes first, but this is generally agreed upon to be his name. And uh, he, was, uh, he lost his father at a young age. And then he went to the Nizamiya College, which tells us that he was probably from an important background, like an average person. It's not like now where you could theoretically get a good grade on a college entrance exam or the ACT in America and go to a good university. Back then, you usually had to come from some you know, important background to go somewhere like that. So he probably wasn't a farmer or something like that or you know, working in the fields. He's probably from the city and has like a family of, like you'd say, noble background. And Nizamiya was, of course, kind of like the Harvard or the Oxford of its day. It was considered the premier uh, learning institution in the Muslim world. And uh, it's in modern-day Baghdad, Iraq, which is relatively close to Shiraz, especially considering, you know, the grand scale of the Muslim world. And there he kind of pursued the average studies. So what we would consider today Islamic studies, but back then it was just studies. So they had, you know, fiqh, which is Islamic law and Quran memorization and understanding and Arabic grammar and logic and all these things. And he kind of in the Bustan and Golestan sometimes mentions uh, little anecdotes about his time in, uh, in Baghdad. And uh, we know that he studied with the uh, Hanbali scholars, which is interesting because the Hanbali mazhab uh, kind of faded away in Iran. Uh, we're not really, I'm not really sure how it came to be that he was Hanbali, whether Shiraz was Hanbali or it just happened to be the predominant mazhab of uh, 
Iraq at the time, but nonetheless, it kind of is, is less popular in that region now. And uh, I believe he belonged to the Ash'ari theological school. So that combination of Hanbali and Ash'ari doesn't really exist nowadays, I don't think. But anyway, <laughs> enough of that. Um, his name, Sa'adi, is not actually his name. So a lot of times when we think of Rumi, Sa'adi, Hafez, we think these are like their first name. But these were actually pen names. And usually they were based off either a characteristic of the person. So Hafez, for example, means memorizer of the Quran. Or sometimes they were actually named after the people they worked for. So Saadi's name comes from the local Atabeg, which is like a name for a, kind of like a Turkic ruler, Saad ibn Zangi. So he was named Saadi, you know, with, out of respect for him. Another title that he's been given is Sheikh Shab Shuk Shihaz, which um, means the uh, like young or kind of like youthful, uh, funny or like jokester Sheikh of Shiraz. And that really does kind of uh, cover his personality very well, especially if you read his Golestan. It's kind of full of kind of jokes and quips. And he, is, he has a very lively kind of soul and personality. And of course, for those of you who are familiar with his Golestan, you'll know that the Mongol invasion led him to wander around a lot in the Muslim world, which is where he collects a lot of this wisdom and, you know, this advice and what makes him so intelligent is because, you know, as they say, uh, he, I think he wrote himself um, that uh, something like, something like that. It's like... Uh, the naive person will not become weathered and experienced without traveling. And the Sufi will not become drunken unless they drink the glass. So he's basically kind of hinting that his wisdom, you know, his smarts, what we like him for, came from his traveling the world. And he writes about this extensively in the Gulistan. But the Mongol invasion, I mean, it's kind of distant from our uh, memories now. We don't really think about it, of course. Unfortunately, in the Muslim world, we've had so many catastrophes that it's like fallen back in our memory. But of course, back then, it was like the catastrophic, catastrophic event that definitely not only shaped his lifetime, but for centuries to come. So before that, uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar, Baghdad was, you know, kind of the golden age Baghdad that we Muslims love to talk about. You know, we had all these discoveries and things like that. And Nizamiya and and all these famous uh, people that we know, Khwarizmi and mathematics and physics and chemistry and all these things, you know, medicine were developed in Baghdad. And uh, the Mongol invasion basically destroyed Baghdad and destroyed the libraries and threw the books in the water and kind of ended that era of Islamic uh, history, so to speak. So Sa'adi was famous throughout his life because his ghazals or his love poems were quite famous. Right. So he would write ghazals and of course, back then it would travel via word of mouth. And just via that, he had become quite famous as a poet and earned a lot of respect. But after about three decades of just writing these types of poems, you're not producing uh, the Golistan or Bustan or what we're going to read in this class. He uh, returns home. Right. So after the uh, let's say the Islamic world is kind of settled and the Mongol invasions have kind of settled, he returns home to Shiraz and he's famous. But he kind of and he writes this in the Golistan. And Busani resents the fact that he's not famous for, let's say, the right things, that he's become known as kind of like a joke, uh, not a joke, but let's say too lighthearted, too, you know, too much of a lover, not enough of like a serious person. He hasn't produced any serious work. And later, uh, next class, we'll read a little, a little bit about that. But basically, he sets out to compose the Golestan and Bustan, which are kind of counterweight to his famous Qazals as a kind of response to that legacy to say, you know, I'm going to leave behind something serious. And this is why the Golestan and Bustan are kind of full of advice and kind of intelligent quips and, you know, ways to live your life. He kind of, kind of wants to live behind a legacy other than just, you know, being kind of like a love poet. And it's interesting that he decided not to present these works at the court directly. So he decided to kind of keep a distance from the royal, royal family. And despite the fact that he spent uh, let's say the last half of his life in Shiraz, and he was quite famous. He probably could have lived a life of excess. He just decided to live in a Sufi hospice or like a Khanga or Darga, as we would say in, in Muslim languages. So he decided to just like live a, a life that was kind of renounced from the world and kind of live in seclusion with the, with the Sufis. So a note on his writing, I mentioned that in the Gulistan and the Bustan, although we won't come across kind of autobiographical writing, autobiographical writing in this text that we'll cover in this class, that in these texts, you see a lot of people, or you see a lot of, I should say, anecdotes where it's purported to be in the first person. And uh, Saadi kind of does this a lot of times for, for poetic effect. So it's important to consider that when he writes things in the first person, sometimes it's kind of a bit exaggerated, but that's for the effect of the poem. It's not like as if he's lying to us. It's like any of us, if we tell a story to our friends, sometimes we embellish funny details, not because you know, we want to mislead them about, you know, what happened in our day, but just to make them like laugh more. This is kind of the vibe that exists in Saadi's poetry. So it's just something to keep in mind. 
All right. Um, I want to ask you guys, does anyone, and you can just chat, does anyone know what this map is? So it's dated 1279, which is towards the end of Saadi's life. And uh, it's showing a big, you know, geographical expanse. Does anyone know who was ruling, I should say, this geographical expanse at the time? You can chat it or you can unmute yourself and say it. Any idea, any guesses? All right, at least give some guesses. Come on. I know that you guys, you guys could guess. No, not the Abbasids. The Abbasids were destroyed by these people. This is right after the Abbasids. All right, you know what? Since there's not enough guesses, I'll just give it away. So this is a map of the approximate region, of course it's approximated, that the Mongols controlled in 1279. So just to give you guys um, an idea of you know, how expansive the Mongol territory was. So they started you know, out here, which is their modern, you know, the modern country of Mongolia, their homeland, and they expanded all the way out you know, to you know, basically our modern day homelands. And they went all the way out almost to Constantinople and the borders of Europe. So just to give you an idea of the vast, you know, amazing territory that they were able to conquer, you know, one of the greatest military feats. Of course, we were at, at the expense of us, but still one of the greatest military, you know, feats of all time. And of course, right here um, in modern Iran, like right about here is where Shiraz is, where, you know, Saadi would have been. And this is where Baghdad was, where he was studying. So, you know, they were on the edges, but still, you know, they made it that far and uh, had, you know, destroyed the caliphate, so to speak. And... Uh, so now we'll talk a bit about the Mongol conquest. And it's really important because it really shapes Saadi's life. And it kind of has, it kind of dovetails nicely or maybe not so nicely with, you know, the, the Muslim world we have today. And, and I'll kind of explain why. So the Mongol conquest were the most traumatic and fateful event in, in Muslim history. Definitely, in my opinion, since the early fitnas and the Karbala massacre. So if you go past the early Islamic history events, uh, basically nothing to that extent or nothing as traumatic as that had occurred, you know, for the Muslim community. And uh, the centers of our culture were destroyed all the way, you know, from Khorasan, way up here and, you know, modern day Afghanistan, Pakistan, all the way out through Baghdad. And, you know, it was just, it's hard to quantify how terrible that was. It was just in terms of people lost, economic output lost, the texts that were destroyed, you know, all the things that happened, it's just impossible to cover it. Important figures like Attar, Kamal al-Din, Ismail, you know, these are two important Persian poets or were killed among, you know, countless others. Who knows how many important figures were, you know, met their demise because of the Mongol conquest. The conquests actually were responsible for Maulana Rumi's, you know, our beloved Rumi's migration from Khorasan to Rum. So not in 1279, but way before that, and I think the 1210s, his family was based around this area and uh, Khorasan. And his father, you know, for various reasons, but also because he had the foresight to see that the Mongols were coming, decided to move his family out westward to right about here, which is, you know, modern day Konya. But unfortunately, by the time, you know, Rumi was an older man, the Mongols had actually made it all the way there. So he ended up being, you know, ruled by the Mongols regardless later in his life, just to give you an idea of, you know, how, uh, how big their expanse of the territory they covered were. So, you know, mass populations migrated, mass, there was mass killings, unfortunately. It was a hugely traumatic event. And Baghdad, of course, maybe the worst, you know, to kind of capitalize how bad it was, Baghdad was destroyed, you know, the capital of Islam, the center of the Golden Age, and all of those things. Now, of course, these are some depictions I tried to find um, for you all. This is just to give you an idea of, uh, of their movements. And uh, this is an old depiction of Baghdad being sieged. So you can see the Baghdad city walls, which of course no longer exists, you know, the beautiful city of Baghdad. And the Mongols are outside, you know, catapulting, throwing fire. I guess maybe they had some people inside. But uh, it was a hugely traumatic event. And this is another depiction of Baghdad being destroyed. And it, it really shaped kind of Saadi's psyche, I think. And the reason I think it's, it's important to talk about this, of course, it you know, impacts the, the poet and, and how he views the world. It's, um, I think sometimes when we as Muslims are helpless or we feel helpless or we feel very you know, down in the dumps about the state of the Muslim world, we think about what's going on in Palestine and so many other you know, parts of the Muslim world. Um, it's very easy to feel defeatist and think, you know, we're never gonna recover. Nothing will ever get better. Nothing will happen for us. But an event just as bad as all the events that we're experiencing today, which was, you know, the Mongol conquest did occur. And then even still after that, you know, Islam had a lot of, you know, uh, let's say great moments, greatest hits moments. We captured Istanbul, Constantinople, which we celebrate that so much in 1453, it was over two centuries after the Mongol, uh, about like, almost exactly two centuries after the Mongol collapse of Baghdad, you know, so we say after the darkest night, there is the brightest day. So, I mean, of course, so many other events, you know, so many 
uh, poets like Hafez and you know all these great people they came after you know the Mongol era so uh, I'd like to cover this to say that you know even though sometimes we can feel or it's easy to think that you know this is the worst it's ever been Islam will never come back we're you know we're done for the West has totally conquered us we faced enemies you know before and we've come out to tell about it so inshallah we can also you know uh, look to tell about this uh, current troubles that we're facing so um yeah exactly exactly Beautiful. I love that. I love the chat. So Saadi, uh, you might not have known that he actually wrote Arabic. He was fluent, of course, you know, to study uh, in the Madrasa system in Baghdad. You had to know Arabic. But it's one thing, as many of us know, it's one thing to know Arabic, but it's another thing to know, know Arabic and be able to write in it and speak it and things like that. So Saadi has this beautiful couplet that he uh, wrote about Baghdad. He said, Habastu bijafni al mudama la tajri, falama toga al ma'u estatala ala sukri. Nasimu Saba Baghdad Bad Kharabha Tamanetu Lokana Tamurru ala Gabri. So he uh, he wrote, though I can find my tears so they don't flow, when water floods, past eyelids it will go. Baghdad's breeze following its destruction, I wish that over my grave it would blow. So, you know, he's kind of lamenting the loss of Baghdad and saying, you know, I just wish the, the breeze of Baghdad would blow, blow over my grave one day. So you can only imagine you know, how traumatic it must have been. So, all right, now we'll cover, uh, you know, a bit of Saadi's output, just to give you an idea of the type of things he's left behind for us. So the most famous uh, work before the Golestan and Bustan was, of course, his Divan, which is his collection of poetry. Uh, it consists of 673 ghazals, 146 quatrains, and a bunch of other poems. It's, it's, it's very long, you know, it's a, it's a work on its own accord, and um, it's full of beautiful poems. And until this day, he's really known for his prowess as kind of like a wordsmith in this Aza, on this Divan, especially in his ghazals. And then this is a few manuscripts of the first uh, uh, poem in the Divan, Avval Daftar Benom Izad Dana. So, uh, you know, it's a very famous um, beginning of the, the Daftar. So in the beginning of the Daftar, the, the book, um, in the name of God, the, the all-knowing, right? So in, in a kind of a Persian version of the Bismillah. And then he has another work, which he composed after his Divan was mostly done which is called the Bustan or the Orchard. He wrote it in 1257. And this dating is done with the help of his own writings in the book. The Bustan is totally in verse, which is uh, the source of what we'll be reading in this class, actually this text. And uh, by totally in verse, I mean, it's all in poetry. So it's all rhyming in its own meter. And it consists of stories and kind of advice is kind of extolling Islamic virtues, the kind of the way to live our lives the best, let's say. And uh, it has a more important, and, uh, you know, a more, a more important and a more serious tone than the Golestan. So the Golestan, which we won't have a chance to look at in this class, is kind of has more jokes, more funny anecdotes. It has more quips, maybe uh, like stuff that's a, it's a bit out there. But the Golestan, not so much. The Golestan is kind of more serious in its tone. And uh, it consists of 10 chapters. Uh, I'm not going to, it's one of those things. I'm not going to read the whole slide. You can uh, check it out, inshallah. And it's been translated, you know, a few times in multiple languages. So if you're interested, you could definitely uh, see the rest of it on your own. But just kind of like the titles of the chapters gives you an idea that it's a more serious text. And this is uh, the very famous introduction to the Bustan Benama Khoda. Benama Khoda Vande Jan Afarin, Hakim Sokhan Dar Zaban Afarin. So um, it's like the name, of, uh, the name of God who has created the soul, the Hakim of Sokhan, like the, the master of, of speech. And, uh, you know, basically kind of like the, all these texts start um, by kind of extolling God and, and praising God and the prophet and things like that. So, of course, we don't have time to get into all of it, but uh, it's a beautiful text, of course, in its own right. And then again, the same text. And then uh, just different versions. And the Golestan, as I said, it's, uh, it's kind of a bit more less, it's a bit less serious in its tone. It was written in 1258, so just one year after the Bustan. So he composed them in direct succession. It's much shorter than the Bustan. I think it's about like half the length when you, when you look at it. And uh, it has a lot of, like I said, humor and jokes and things like that. And it's considered, uh, although it's, it's kind of like less serious than Bustan, it's, it's more, I, I would say, more famous than the Bustan because it's considered kind of like the, the peak of Persian prose. So if you ask people... Uh, who are familiar, you know, what is, where is the best Persian prose that I could ever see? A lot of times they would say it's in the Golestan, and especially in, in, the, introduc in the introduction chapter, the Dibache. It's quite beautiful. And the Golestan actually became the standard of Persian education. Uh, so if you were to learn Persian in a madrasa, 
really anywhere in the Islamic world, usually it would start with the Benoma Khodavanda Azovajal or Minnat Khodaira Azovajal, I'm sorry. So it begins with the first kind of line of the, the Golestan, this very famous introduction, uh, you know, thanks is due to God, uh, Azzawajal. And uh, it has eight chapters, so a bit shorter than the Bustan, and, but has, you know, similar themes. So th those of you who are listening, who come from uh, maybe South Asian, Turkish, or Iranian, Persian kind of backgrounds, your ancestors definitely are, would have been familiar with this book. You know, unfortunately, after colonization, they kind of dismantled this education system, and hopefully we can help renew it. But um, this would have been a book that they would definitely be familiar with, with the, you know, the sayings and, and things like that. And this is the introduction that I read, Minnat Khudai Ro Azzawajal Kita Atash Mujib Qurbatas. It's a very famous line. You know, uh, thanks is due to God, you know, the glorious and the great, who, uh, who worshiping him is kind of a cause for proximity to him. A very famous line in the Persian language. And, you know, it's been produced beautifully so many times. So I'll read just a, a short section from the Encyclopedia Iranica, just to give you an idea of how important Saadi was just in his day, but which was a big deal. So nowadays, of course, it's easy to say so-and-so is famous, you know, a thousand years, 500 years has passed. Time has, you know, and they've taken their time to kind of, you know, the work has spread here and there. But it's amazing to be famous during that day. This is before the Internet, before phones, before TV, you know, where information just spread via word of mouth. So being famous then was a really big deal. So although Saadi spent the final decades of his life in Shiraz, his poetry and reputation had spread throughout the Persophone, meaning Persian-speaking world, traveling even to places that he probably had never seen in person, although he was well-traveled. So in India, his lyric poetry in particular made a significant impression on the two master poets of Delhi in the late 12th and 13th century, the famous Amir Khosrow, of course, who we know, and uh, Hassan Sej Sejzi, who I've not heard of, unfortunately. And as Qiran as Saadain Khosrow, Amir Khosrow, chides himself for aspiring to write poetry during Saadi's lifetime. This is a very a kind of a traditional in, in like the Persian speaking culture and the Muslim culture, of course. It's like a very, very, it's a way to show respect to see, you know, how dare I produce poetry or do X, Y, Z while this master is alive. So he's saying in the age of Saadi, may it never grow old, meaning may the age never go away. Uh, aren't you ashamed speaking to himself to compose poetry? You know, how could you compose poetry when he's producing, you know, stuff that's so good? All right, so now, uh, you know, unfortunately, Saadi passed away uh, of, uh, you know, of natural causes. So he happened to avoid, you know, the, uh, let's say the dangers of his era. He died of natural causes in Shiraz after living in old age. It's funny because uh, actually in the introduction of the Golestan, uh, I've snipped it out for us, even though we're not reading from the Golestan from next class. Saadi thinks he's not going to live a long time. He thinks that he's going to live to be 55 years old. He says, oh, 50 years of my life have passed and only five years remain. But uh, he lived to be approximately, I think, 80 or 90. It's kind of debated. So he was eventually buried in Shiraz. And this is what his grave would have looked like way earlier in the day. You can tell by the clothes, of course. This is, you know, hundreds of years, hundreds of years ago. And uh, this is it from a different angle. Someone sitting there and studying. And uh, this is, uh, you know, when photographs first emerged in the, I think, early 19th century, maybe mid-19th century in the Hajar era. So I'm not sure, unfortunately, we don't have much information about these structures. I wish we had taken time to write more, but I'm not sure if this is the same structure that, um, that we are currently, uh, you know, that we're currently seeing or, or not. But uh, you can see, you know, it was built in a kind of a traditional style. And this is another view with some, uh, with some local people going to, take, to visit uh, Saadi. And this is just another view from the side. Uh, I'm very fascinated by these old uh, photographs of, you know, the Muslim world. And this is another view of a, uh, some people, you know, maybe a, a family or something like that, or a school field trip <laughs> or something. And this is another view of the entrance, which kind of gives us a hint that, so this is what we're looking at right here. This corner gives us a hint that they had, you know, built it again. So maybe it was in bad shape. So they kind of rebuilt it and it looks a bit more modern, you know, it looks, you can kind of see the European influence coming in the, the late 19th century, or maybe even very early 20th century. It's kind of hard to tell. And this is the, the place today. I don't really like the current one. I'm not the biggest fan. I like the older version better. This is kind of like a, a modern Iranian attempt to kind of blend tradition and modern styles. And I feel like they could have done a bit better. But, uh, but nonetheless, you know, it uh, looks nice, alhamdulillah. And this is a view from the front. And this is a view of Saadi's grave itself, which in the photo that I have in front of it, you can see it's covered with glass now to kind of preserve it. I don't know. I don't think actually if this is the original uh, stone that we saw a few slides back. I, maybe this is like a century old or something like that. But nonetheless, you know, from the inside, it looks nice. And inshallah. It could be, uh, you know, qismat for all of you to visit it one day in Shiraz. So I found an interesting, uh, when I was re researching this, I found an interesting couplet 
by Malik al Bahar, who was a very famous kind of, I don't, I don't want to say court poet, but kind of a, a poet politician in the, in the late uh, Qajar era to early Pahlavi era. He says, Bar sara murgada sa'adi ke maqam sa'adas, bas tadast adab o jabhe ya qadam sazer sam. So he's saying at the head of Saadi's tomb, which is the place of happiness, uh, with my hands closed, you know, kind of like, you know, you close in prayer out of respect, with my hands closed or folded in adab, and with my forehead, you know, kind of down, I'll, uh, I'll arrive. So kind of showing, you know, the respect that they had for this, uh, this place. And uh, in that same vein, I thought we'd look at a few more poems, uh, kind of praising Saadi, just to give you an idea of his importance in the tradition. So we have uh, Jami, he says, Sheikh Saadi Shirazi, Rahmatullah Ta'ala, Qudvat al-Mutagazzalan as, Hich kas pi shazwe, bi shazwe, tariq ghazal navarzide, va sokhanan wei, hame tabayr ra maqbul uftade. Yeki as shuara gufta as, va alhaq gohar insaf sufte. So he's saying, um, and of course the, the translation is uh, here, he's saying Sheikh Saadi Shirazi made God's mercy be upon him, is the first among the composers of Ghazals, and no one has exceeded him in output or quality, and uh, his words are accepted by all peoples, and a poet eloquently said regarding him. Um, all right, I want to see, out of the participants here, does anyone want to volunteer to read this poem? Of course, there's no pressure, no judgment, but I would love it if we could try to practice reading the poems together, if anyone's interested. Uh, so you can just unmute yourself and, and do so Hello. if you would like to. Hello? Hello. Hi, yes, my name is Saif. Salam alaikum. Alaikum salam, Saif. Thanks for volunteering. Yeah, can I try? Of course, go for it. Go for it. Sheikh Saadi Shirazi, Rahmatullahi Ta'ala Ala. Kudwata, Kudwate, Muta, Muta Gazilani asked, Hitchkas, Bish as we, Bish as we, Tariq Gazil, Navari Zide, Osuhanane, Hamia. Tawaif ra makbul uftade. Yeki as shora gufte ast wa al hak gohar gohar in son in soft sufte. Perfect, perfect, great. And now just the poem, just a few lines remaining. Dar sharese kes payam baron and har chand ki la nabi badi o soft wa kasti de wa gazala gazalra. Firdosi wa Anwari Saadi. Beautiful, wa Saadi. Great, great, amazing. All right, so now we can cover some of the vocab of this. I said we'd be learning vocab. So this is uh, the the first vocab is one of these kind of Arabic phrases that we have in you know Persian, Turkish, Urdu that we've taken from Arabic. Qudwat mutagazzalan. Qudwa is like a leader, and mutagazzalan is the people who write qazal. So you can see qazal is is embedded in there, and this is a trick. For those of you who have not studied uh, Arabic, but you want to figure out what, what an Arabic word is, if you can recognize a word embedded in it, usually it's related. So he's a leader of the people who do tagazol, uh, they write tazaz. Tawaif is the Arabic plural of ta'ifa. So ta'ifa is the word for like clan or group or something like that. And uh, when he says hamet tawaif ro magbul, it means he's accepted by all groups of people, meaning the Sufis, the non Sufis, etc. And shu'ara is another one of these Arabic plurals, um, which Malik al-Shu'ara Bahar had his, his, in his name, which is a jam of sha'ir, means poet. And gohar softan is a very interesting phrase. Um, it means to literally to pierce a pearl, but the idea is that you've spoken truth or you've spoken truth eloquently, so to speak, right? So it's difficult to pierce a pearl. You have a perfectly round pearl and you want to have a hole directly in the middle of it. You know, if you go one way or the other, then it's ruined. It needs to go directly through the middle. So it's like a, you know, it's a metaphor for skillfully speaking. And uh, the phrase, la nabi ba'di, which is a kind of basic Arabic uh, to, you know, for, to understand even for us, there's no prophet after me. It's a reference to a hadith in Bukhari and Tirmizi that uh, where the Prophet والسلام, said that there would be no prophet after me. Of course, we as Muslims know that. And then Osaf is the jam of wasf, which means descriptions. So uh, to cover the translation, he's saying in poetry, there are three, there are prophets in uh, three, right? Though he, the Prophet والسلام, said, there's no prophet after me. So this is kind of like a Persian uh, way of, we, we kind of speak in exaggeration sometimes. He doesn't mean literally a prophet, of course. He means they're like prophetic. They're so amazing. And of course, in English, even in day-to-day -day speech, we say it, oh, you know, this, this chai is to kill for, 
you know, of course we would never kill for China. So uh, Jami, Molana Jami, who of course we know there's no, there's no need to say what his rank in this tradition is, says that there are three prophets in poetry and uh, the, in, in terms of qasidas and ghazals and descriptions, you know, and how well they describe things, it was Ferdowsi, which of course is a famous uh, Shahnama poet, who's still famous, Anvari, who unfortunately is not really famous anymore uh, for whatever reason, and Sa'adi. So just to give you an idea of, you know, how important he is. Someone Jami, you know, just a few centuries after was recognizing his greatness. And of course, Hafez, who is from Shiraz, you know, Saadi's city, uh, just, I think he was in, born in the century right after Saadi. He says, Ustad al-Suhan Saadi is Pisha Hamakaz. You know, for every single person, for everyone, Saadi is the Ustad of speech. You know, there's, there's no one like him. And uh, Saifuddin Muhammad Farghani says, uh, in a, it's about him. It says, in a poem that Saif composed on sending some samples of his poetry to Saadi, Saif al-Din confesses that, his eagerness, that in his eagerness to please, I didn't realize that it is foolish to send copper to a gold mine. So Saif al-Din, of course, this is a practice poets would do. I mean, even nowadays, they compare work. They would send each other poetry from city to city to kind of review each other's work and see what the other cities were up to, et cetera. And uh, you know, Saif al-Din wrote, he confessed that sending his poetry to Saadi is like sending copper to the gold mine. You know, there's no use. And Shahriyar, who's a, you know, a much later uh, poet in, uh, from modern Iran, he just died a, you know, a few decades ago, says, So he's saying centuries have passed and Sa'adi's beautiful words are still in people's mouths, O oh Shiraz. All right. So, uh, oh, I said I would give you guys chances to read. So I'm stealing all the chances from you. Does anyone want to volunteer to read this line? Hmm. Anyone, anyone want to volunteer? Alaikum salam, welcome. So can I read it? I'll try at least. Please, please. Jikush gupt sadi khudai sukhan. Perfect, yeah, exactly. So this is Arif al-Azvini, a later poet. And I mean, so many of the words are common across Islamic languages. You, know, you guys probably could pick out what he's saying, but how sweetly Saadi spoke. And again, like the exaggeration, I said they called him a prophet. So Arif al-Azvini said he's the Khudai Sukhan, he's the Lord or the God of speech, you know. He's so good at speech that no one has uh, kind of surpassed him in that quality. And what we mean by that is when they say this, it's not like he's the undisputed best poet, right? So some people say Rumi is the best Sufi poet, or Hafiz is the best Gnostic poet, you know, or Amin Khusra is the best Qawali tradition, or Muhammad Iqbal has the best Islamic, modern Islamic philosophy. You could always say these things, but in terms of just pure eloquence, like the way the words flow and the way they rhyme and, you know, the way he plays with the words. And sometimes, you know, he has lines where every word, the shape looks like the word above it, even though they're different words, right? So, in, and uh, of course the Arabic uh, writing system, you can do that, right? So you can have khosh and jush, for example, like just to give you an idea, it could be something like this, you know, khosh and jush. But you could have words like a Saadi line where almost every word looks exa like exactly the same as the one in the line above it. So just to show you, you know, his extent of his greatness in, uh, in you know, writing. So for those of you who are interested to read more about Saadi, I mean, there's no way in, in just like a short, you know, one hour class I could summarize everything. You can uh, look at Beholding Beauty, Saadi of Shiraz and the Aesthetics of Desire, Medieval Persian Poetry by... Um, uh, Domenico Ingenito, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. And you can also look at Saadi, the poet of life, love, and compassion by Homa Kautuzian. All right. So that is the end of this, uh, the PowerPoint that I prepared. But uh, since we have some time, because I speak rather quickly, uh, I'd like to spend some time to talk to you guys because, you know, we're going to be together for four more classes. So, of course, it's good for us to kind of get to know each other. Um, but I was wondering if... Uh, Maybe you guys could take turns, just like adding like a quick thing. Uh, I'd like to know, uh, let's say like where you're from in terms of like culturally speaking. And uh, if you're, if Saadi, uh, you know, is familiar to you in terms of, you know, where you're from or your tradition or your family, or if you have had a Saadi book growing up, I'm just interested to kind of hear that perspective. Like how much you know about him? Uh, do you have a family member that read him? And, um, you know, anyone can, can volunteer. Assalamu alaikum again. Alaikum salam. 
um, uh, thank you for these sessions. They are very invigorating, very informative. Um, so much, my, my, pleasure. Name Asna, my, my name is Asna Sair and I'm from India, um, Jammu and Kashmir. Kashmir is always in the news for good or bad reasons, so <laughs> yeah. you might know this. Of course, of course. Yes, so I'm from Kashmir. We have the Kashmiri culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, I saw this story. I saw Actually, I saw your page on Instagram and I really liked it. I'm uh, very much inclined towards this uh, virtual language. And, thank you, um, thank you. Actually, um, there was uh, this couplet, uh, little couplet uh, from uh, by Amir Khusro Rahmatullah Ta'ala Ale because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, we read him in India. Mm -hmm. So it was, um, can I read uh, these few lines? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, go ahead. It was, Mantu Shudam to Man Shudhi, Mantan Shudam to Jam Shudhi, Ta Kas Na Goyat Baadazi Mandi Garam to Digri. So mm. when I translated these lines because I didn't know this language before. So when mm -hmm. I did it, I was totally uh, blown by the meaning of this language and mm. it was just so beautiful. No mm -hmm. other language could do justice to the desires mm -hmm. of uh, what any wali or whosoever writes in the Persian um, can can do. So that's mm. why I was very much inclined towards this language. So I joined this class. Actually, I joined this page of yours. I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad. So when you... You're doing uh, an amazing job. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you. I appreciate it. Did you have any? Uh, did you have any experience with Saadi before? Did you know anyone that read him, or had you? No, I, just, I just, I just heard his name somewhere. That um, maybe I have seen it on your page only. I didn't <laughs> all know right, about all right, no worries. Uh, this session, I got really very much um, uh, insights about him. I'm glad. I'm so glad. So I'm, I'm glad to have you then, inshallah, for the next classes. All inshallah, right, great. Inshallah. Thank you so much for having me. Th thank you. Thank you. Hello. 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 Hello again. I'm Saif. Mohammed Saif. No, of course. Yeah, I, I see your name down there. I can see you guys' name when yeah. you speak, by the way. So, yeah. Uh -huh. okay. okay. All right. So, uh, mm -hmm. I'm also from Kashmir, but I'm actually living in Tehran, in Iran. I'm a really? Here. No yeah. Way. Yeah. Amazing. Like, like, really. I'm studying in Tehran University of Medical Sciences. I'm a medical student here. Mashallah. Okay, so then you see Saadi's paintings on the wall and yeah, Saadi Street is close to you, everywhere. right? <laughs> yes, of course, uh, everywhere. I've, I have been to Shiraz also and I have visited. Oh, amazing. Amazing. Everywhere. Yeah. That's so beautiful. So, actually, I was just following this your page on Twitter because, you know, we are almost familiar with uh, Persian language. We can speak Persian. Like, it's very obligatory for us to learn mm -hmm, Persian, mm -hmm. interact with patients and all. So, mm -hmm. Uh, we learned Persian here. It has been like four years. I'm since four years I'm here and Farsi hamya kam balada. Mashallah. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 So the spoken. So, so what brother is saying is that yeah, the spoken, spoken Persian is very different. It's different. Yeah, it's like spoken Urdu and Urdu poetry and yeah. things like that. Yeah, it's the same. Yeah, yeah, of yeah, course. So it's the, different layers. There's layers to these languages. Exactly, exactly. And in, in, in for sure, this poetry needs a higher level. You know, higher level of understanding. Yeah, yeah, language. yeah, yeah. It's it's different. It's different. That's amazing. Yeah. I'm I'm glad. I'm glad yeah. that, uh, where that you're you there. From, like, where are you currently? Like, so I I'm actually right now I'm in the United States. I'm visiting family. Uh -huh. And uh, just uh -huh. taking care of some stuff that I had left here before. But I lived in, I was living in Tehran for the last one year. I was there continuously. So inshallah, when, when my work here is done and I return, we'll visit each other sure. and uh, we'll read Saadi together. Inshallah, definitely. That would inshallah, be great. Definitely. definitely. All right. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much for thanks, having me. Thanks for being here with us. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. Uh, this is Muhammad Abdul Ali from India, Hyderabad. Great, great. Uh, we have been we have been talked about uh, earlier about this uh, by in, uh, being inspired by your username I have chosen him by Dakni Zade. Oh okay, thank you. It's <laughs> fine. And I have been learning Persian for since three, three years. Amazing, great, great. I hope that this class can help that process then. Sure, sure very much. Thank you very much for having me. Great, great. I'm I'm glad to have you in this class, brother. All right. Hello, uh, Assalamu alaikum. Waalaikum salam. 
Hey, my name is Moment. I'm from Canada. Or like great, I great. grew up in um, I grew up in Canada, but originally my parents are from Pakistan. And so of course growing up we didn't really hear that much poetry in general. Mm-hmm. Um like nowadays I've heard my parents talk about Saudi and stuff, but great, growing great. up I had no idea about any of this. Mm-hmm. I think um when I got into first year of university, I started becoming um, more religious and um like in Pakistan we have like a Qawwali tradition. Yeah, right, um, exactly. Yeah, and a lot of those poems were in Persian as well. So just mm-hmm. listening to a lot of qualities, I got like very interested in qualities and poems and um, poems in Urdu and Persian. And mm-hmm. so because of that, like I also found your Instagram page. Mm-hmm. And so I had like some familiarity with Saudi. Great, not great. Not too much. And it's, it's great to learn more though. Great. I'm glad, you know, unfortunately, uh, we come from a similar background than, you know, from Eastern parents, but raised in the West. A lot of times, unfortunately, our parents, you know, it, it's so difficult just to get, you know, acquainted to the new country, to make ends meet, to survive, yeah, exactly. to, to worry about it, and all the problems. Sorry, could you please meet, meet yourself if you're, um, if you're not screen? Sorry. But um, anyway, it's so difficult to do all these just basics just to survive, you know, to keep your head above water. And we, ha- we have no time, you know, to cover these traditions, to talk about, you know, what Gowali is. And maybe we've heard it, you know, sometimes, but they're not going to, our parents don't have time to sit us down. And a lot of times our parents as well, one thing, they're not like professors of our culture. Because when you are from yeah. a country, you inherit the culture naturally. There's, you don't have to teach it to anyone. So our parents were never like taught or put in a position where they were taught to, this is how you'll teach your kids the culture. And even me, mm-hmm. you know, I, I grew up in a house where, uh, on the bookshelf, there was the Quran, the Masnavi, uh, Divan of Hafez, Saadi, mm-hmm. and we didn't really connect much to it. The, I knew that we read Hafez sometimes, that the Quran was, I had to learn the short surahs because my grandfather would, my grandma would teach me, and you know that Saadi we never even looked at. So yeah, this is unfortunately the, the case. Um, but hopefully we can, you know, as we get older, we have more free time, and uh, the internet has helped us quite a bit. We can re- reconnect with these things. So I'm, I'm glad to have you in the class and glad that you're following the page. Yeah, thank you so much. And yeah, I think I relate to that too because um, growing up, like, yeah, of course I wasn't taught uh, any of this stuff, but um, like when I started founding, like, finding out more by myself and then asking my parents, then I also found that, oh, they, they already have a lot of knowledge about it, but mm-hmm. it was just sort of never spoken of or anything. So I think, yeah, it's also really important to try to continue this um mm-hmm. onto the next generation as well which mm-hmm. is going to be difficult in these western countries but yeah, I think yeah. it's important to be looked into yeah absolutely well we, we have a bit of an uphill battle to uh to fight but hopefully it's it's worthwhile it's always worth uh, worth the trouble you know i always i never heard uh someone from my our background say i wish my parents had not taught me my language or things like that yeah, it's always exactly. the other way around it's always man I it's wish always I'd... a regret exactly it's always a regret so hopefully we can kind of you know put a put a pause on that and prevent that from from you know being spread to our kids yeah. and things like that and i that. think the work you're doing is also very important as um like it's sort of tackling this issue head on so i really appreciate the work thank, you're thank doing. you i appreciate it it means a lot thank you all right if anyone else would like to introduce themselves or talk or mention something about sadi um uh, if not then uh, we'll have to say goodbye, unfortunately, until tomorrow at the same time. So tomorrow we'll actually get into the, the meat and bones of the text and we'll be, you know, learning the Saadi's life advice together. So hopefully we can, uh, you know, implement that into our lives and see the, the fruits of, uh, of the wisdom uh, of our ancestors. So uh, without uh, further ado, if no one else uh, wanted to, I think basically everyone who wanted to speak got a chance. So, uh, and if not, next class we can, uh, we can speak more, inshallah. So uh, I'll let you... I'll go with a farewell and I'll see you uh, tomorrow at, uh, at, it's my time is 10 in the morning, but I think the, the time is GMT too. We'll see you at the same time. So, all right. Goodbye, everyone. Uh, as we say. Goodbye. Good night.